Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture in Geography 341, Weather and Society. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and I'm really excited about this one. I love talking about clouds and cloud types, and I just love being able to look up into the sky and identify things, or just in general. That's why I'm a geomorphologist, so I can look at the landscape and identify things. Um, so this is a really fun one. Now, again, uh, I mentioned it in a previous lecture, but I would definitely recommend if you are in, interested in meteorology and this type of stuff in general, uh, picking up this book, National Audubon Society's Field Guide to North American Weather. Uh, definitely look at grabbing it because you can go in and you can look at all the different types of clouds. There we've got Mamatis clouds and a gust fronts and things like that. You can actually see examples. And you can have this with you in your packs or your field guides and and be active uh, interpretive meteorologists yourself. So buckle up for this one. Um, there's a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of recap, but then the rest of the, or the majority of the lecture is going to be just talking about what the different types of clouds are, where they exist in, in the atmosphere, uh, and what altitude, and what they kind of signify. So let's get into it. So again, cloud basics. We've touched on this a bunch. Clouds are collections of atmospheric water, particulates, uh, typical radius around 10 micrometers. Their forms uh, are they're a combo of liquid and solid, you know, water droplets and crystals. They form by condensation or deposition within the atmosphere. We talked about that in the last couple of lectures. And they can form when air becomes saturated by either adding water vapor to it, mixing cold and warm air masses, or cooling it to its dew point. Cloud classification has really been around since uh, 1803. A gentleman by the name of Luke Howard so the terms and basic classification that were then proposed are really still how we do it today. We've got two parts to a cloud's name. It's shape, so for example, cirrus, stratus, or cumulus, and it's height, so the cloud base and vertical extent of the cloud. There are four Latin terms that form the basis for this naming system. Cirrus, which means fibrous or hair-like. Cumulus, which means a heap or a pile. Stratus, which means a horizontal sheet or layer and nimbus, meaning rain-bearing. We also use the prefix alto to indicate medium altitude clouds. Uh, and I also, there is a link that you can go check out. It's a good online guide there if you are interested. So what do clouds tell us? They don't just happen. There's a reason. There's something that drives cloud formation or the various forms of a cloud. There's something that drives their formation. So a particular cloud's shape and location depend on and can tell us about the movement of air at altitude, the amount of water vapor in it, and the stability. Flat clouds, like, you know, if you think of your big stratus clouds or alto clouds, they mean stable air. Puffy clouds, if you think of your cumulus clouds, or you might have heard it called anvil, anvil clouds, that means there's unstable air. There's a vertical motion to the air. So with that vertical motion comes instability, and that's what can drive uh, kind of some of your storms that you that we'll experience and we'll talk about in a little bit. So here's a diagram just depicting many of the, the common cloud types. So clouds, as we were kind of talking about, are classified based off of how they appear from Earth's surface. There are three basic forms. We've got our cirrus clouds or cirriform clouds. Uh, these are high up in altitude. They form these uh, de delicate veil-like or wispy, strandy looking features compared oftentimes to feathers or horses' tails. Um, then you've got your stratus or stratiform clouds. These consist of kind of these continuous sheets across the sky uh, that cover much or the entire sky and in the viewing area. Although there might be minor or distinctive breaks there are no distinctive units. So you might have breaks in, in stratus clouds, but you can't look at a stratus cloud and say that looks like a bunny or an ice cream cone or Napoleon Bonaparte. You can just look at them and say that's a big cloud bank or a sheet of clouds. Um, these typically form when the atmosphere is stable uh, in opposition to cumulus clouds or cumuliform clouds. These consist of these kind of globular cloud masses that look like cotton balls or sheep or bunnies, whatever you want to call them in the sky. Uh, normally they exhibit a flat base and appear as rising domes or towers. And we'll talk about the different types of cumulus clouds later on in the lecture here. 
but they typically form within a layer of the atmosphere where there's some type of instability leading to convection and rising air, which is really important uh, for their development. Then uh, we go over here and we've got one more, the Latin prefix, or sorry, the Latin term for nimbus, which is Latin for violent rain. Um, it's used in the name of a cloud that we see off on the right there, a major producer of precipitation. There's a ton of vertical development going on there and it's pouring. Think of it, those are your, your cumulonimbus or we call these anvil clouds as well. Uh, moving into height designators, we've got kind of our low clouds near the Earth's surface up to an altitude of about 2000 meters. These are generally composed of just water droplets, uh, some ice in the winter. We got our middle clouds. These occupy heights from about 2,000 to 6,000 meters and may be composed of water, droplets, and ice. And then we've got high clouds, which form in the highest and coldest regions of the troposphere, normally have bases of around 6,000 meters and mostly composed of ice crystals or super cooled water droplets. We're going to start out by going top to bottom. So the highest clouds, heights greater than 6,000 meters. Uh, we're going to talk about cirrus, cirrostratus, and cirrocumulus clouds. So these high-level clouds, cir cirrus, or kind of designated as CI, are these white, delicate, fibrous-looking clouds uh, that form in patches or narrow bands. We often see them and describe them as mare's tails, which is a particular form called cirrus un or uncinus. Uh, and they are generally formed entirely of ice crystals. Cirrus clouds are, as I said, really high up in the troposphere. Uh, they kind of look like if they've been smeared on a photograph. Uh, these air temps are well below freezing, and they can actually tell us a couple of interesting things. First off, they have an interesting look to them um, because those ice crystals can refract or bend light, which make them look even wispier or more shimmery. Uh, but they also can be pretty indicative of oncoming storms. Because they're so easily blown about, uh, cirrus clouds often indicate that stormier weather is approaching, usually within a couple of days. So if you see a lot of cirrus clouds, maybe look at the weather charts and see if something is coming in the next couple of days that could be indicative of a major system or pressure system pushing these out of the way. Uh, here we can see a couple examples again. Uh, these kind of delicate icy filaments that we see uh, that are forming almost look like streets or wisps. See a couple more examples here. These are our cirrus uncinus or cloud or you know mare's tail or horse's tail clouds that you can see. Um, and you can kind of see that feature, right? If we look kind of here, we see kind of almost like a horse's tail whipping uh, as it is champing its, its uh, grass or hay. Then we get into cirrostratus clouds, and we can see those here. Uh, these are thin, transparent sheet or veil. Remember that stratus meaning sheet or continuous. Uh, the sun is clearly visible and casting a shadow on the surface, but it kind of gives off this halo appearance that, whoop, that you see right here. Uh, sheets of cirrostratus may cover the entire sky and be up to several or several thousands of meters deep. Um, and see another example of it there. This is uh, the sun on the left and the moon on the right. And you kind of have this haloing effect with both of them. Next, moving into our cirrocumulus clouds. Uh, these appear as thin white patches uh, of kind of these small cells, almost like popcorn it kind of looks like. Uh, they may be merged or separate and often arranged in a pattern that resemble fish scales, uh, which you can see, oh, let's see there. Turn off my little pen tool here for a second. Uh, we often call these mackerel skies. These produce some, uh, I would say, the most uh, stunning and breathtaking sunsets when you've got cirrocumulus clouds in the sky, kind of giving this scaled or popcorn-y type look, uh, and you've got uh, the sunset. So these, this dappling that you see or that kind of popcorny look results from convective overturning within the clouds. So you've got these ripples that form gravity waves and you've got this kind of circulating convection that's going on. Um, they're not precipitation makers per se, 
but they can be a sign of stormy weather to come when cirrus, cirrus clouds, the ones we just talked about, give way to these cirrocumulus clouds. So if you first saw the wispy stuff and then you're seeing these kind of popcorn skies, you can pretty much assume there's something coming. Let's see our mackerel sky there. Next, we're gonna move into middle clouds, so alto stratus and alto cumulus. Here we can see our alto stratus clouds as kind of a grayish sheet uh, here. So they refer to basically formless layer of grayish clouds is what alto stratus means. Uh, cover all or large portion of the atmosphere or of the sky, pardon me. Uh, generally, we can see the sun through alto stratus clouds as kind of this bright diffuse looking disk. Uh, they can produce infrequent precipitation, like light snow or drizzle, um, and they're commonly associated with approaching warm fronts that may thicken into darker gray layers or nimbostratus clouds. So we can see them here, and we can also see them here. These are kind of our altostratus clouds. Next are altocumulus clouds, tend to form in large patches composed of rounded masses or rolls that may not merge. Kind of this, again, you can almost describe it as like a popcorn sky. Uh, because they're generally composed of water droplets rather than ice crystals, the individual cells usually have a much more distinct and less wispy outline. Um, shape and texture are variable, and there are several distinct subclasses of these altocumulus clouds. So we'll get into what those are here in just a second. The first of them here are Altocumulus lenticularis. These are white or gray lenticular or lens shaped clouds formed by the lifting of air over a topographic barrier. And we'll talk about these again a little bit later on in the video, but you can kind of see they've almost got this, it's almost like you've stacked a bunch of plates on one another. Do you kind of see that look? If I was to take my little pen here, you kind of see, you know, plates of different sizes kind of being stacked on top of one another as you go. Then we've got Altocumulus castellanus, or AC cast uh, clouds. These are white or gray broken cumulus clouds or cumulus light clouds. Uh, the upper part appearing almost castle-like. They've got these kind of low, tall towering forms and they can kind of sometimes be arranged in these kind of linear forms that you're seeing here. Then we've got Altocumulus undulatus or AC UND. These are white or gray patches or sheets of clouds with an undulating or rippled appearance. So here you can see there's some type of atmospheric pattern, usually uh, convection or some type of rolling process that is leading to this linear formation of clouds. Next, we move into our low clouds. So stratus, nimbostratus, or stratocumulus. Stratus clouds, these gray featureless layer of clouds with a uniform base, we often associate these with drizzles, you know, light drizzles or snow. Nimbostratus are these dark gray featureless thick layers of clouds. Remember, nimbo is or nimbus is our violent rain prefix. These are associated with uh, prolonged precipitation commonly forming in frontal systems. So Think of these nimbostratus as kind of your long-term drenchers, right? Your multi-day, your know, cloud is always covered. You're getting a bunch of rain consistently. That's not low enough to be a drizzle. It's consistent, decent rainfall. We got our stratus clouds here, just our dominant subtype we can see here and here. Uh, stratus clouds form in these low horizontal layers that may on occasion make light drizzle or mist. They are light gray and have a uniform base and appear to blanket the entire sky. Uh, and here we can see our nimbus stratus. I'm going to delete this one. Moving on, we can see our stratocumulus. Uh, these consist of broken patches of clouds that are generally much larger than those of an alto uh, stratus cloud. They often cover vast stretches of the subtropical oceans, providing a ready supply of surface moisture. They reflect considerable amounts of incoming solar radiation or insulation. 
So you can kind of see, uh, you've, I know you've seen these kind of big, broad plan forms that are covering the sky here. So those are our stratocumulus clouds. And see one more, that's from above, that cloud base from uh, above the clouds. You can see another example of it here and here. Here we can see stratocumulus with a phenomenon called virga, which is these hair-like strands of falling rain evaporating before uh, below the cloud before reaching the surface. We'll talk about virga very briefly in our precipitation lecture next. Then we're going to move into our clouds with vertical development, so our cumulus or cumulonimbus clouds. So cumulus clouds all have a somewhat puffy aspect, but have different appearances depending on their altitude and how unstable the air is or how strongly the air is rising. Uh, cumulus clouds are produced by air rising under its own impetus or free convection. We talked about that uh, in the previous lecture where we talked about what causes air to rise uh, and indicate that air may be unstable to some degree. So here we can see a couple brilliant examples of cumulus clouds. There are these bright white to gray, dense, detached clouds. They form these clumps. You could call them cauliflower. You could call them, you know, some form of shape, animal description, whatever. Um, they have a very flat base. You can see that evident here and here. Uh, and sharp outlines because these are comprised of water droplets for the most part at this altitude instead of ice, which gives, as we can see up here, the wispier appearance that these clouds have versus your cumulus clouds. So the base of these clouds is basically, uh, we kind of talked about it before, you might, you might be thinking about it now, that's our lifting condensation level. So air has cooled to its dew point here by the time you get to this point where you see kind of the base of your, your cumulus clouds. So that's that lifting condensation level we talked about in the wild here in this picture. If you were to look at these, you could describe them in terms of are they growing or are they dissipating? So notice how uh, there is vertical building in these clouds here, but also notice how refined and particular those edges are. So these are actively growing, whereas this one here on the other side, notice how wispy that is, that's actively dissipating. So cumulus clouds can be indicative of a whole lot of things. Uh, in this case, these are what we would call cumulus humilis clouds uh, or fair weather cumulus clouds. They're often characterized by small vertical development. There's not much air rising rapidly uh, into the atmosphere. They've got uniform flat bases and general similarity. So the vertical growth is usually restricted by the existence of a temperature inversion in the atmosphere. This in turn explains the unusually uniform height of the cloud tops of this cumulus species. Notice, if we're looking at these uh, two example pictures here, they're all about the exact same height uh, from base to top. And that's because they're being restricted by something. So a single cloud element that is able to penetrate that temperature inversion may develop in what we call cumulus congestus, or even further to become cumulonimbus. We'll talk about those here in a, in a little bit. Um, but as in all species of cumulus, wind shear with height may give rise to kind of hard appearance up shear where the cloud erosion uh, in dry environmental air is taking place. That fuzziness uh, starts to occur. So these clouds can dissipate under the right conditions. Um, so this species is unique to the genus cumulus. You don't see, you know, stratus humilis or other clouds like that. We can see another example of these cumulus humilis clouds here from above. Here, these are what we call cumulus mediocris. Uh, these are basically cumulus clouds with moderate vertical extent. Um, notice again, they're pretty uniform in size, uh, almost symmetrical top to side. Um, we can see here. So there's not, again, there's not a lot going on here, but there is some vertical development that we can infer. Um, so 
perhaps if we move from cumulus humilis to cumulus mediocris, we're seeing some type of vertical develop developing occurring, which suggests that there's some type of rising instability within the atmosphere. With that rising instability, we can get things like cumulus congestus clouds. So these are, you know, kind of crowded, congested uh, field of the cumulus subtype. And as you see, there is greater vertical development here. So we've got a bunch of cumulus clouds that are hanging out right here. And this is the cumulus congestus cloud. I'm kind of sketching it out here. Um, sorry, my mouse. There we go. Uh, that's our cumulus congestus cloud. So they can produce rain, uh, but they can also continue to develop. So here we're seeing some type of vertical motion of our air and instability that is increasing within the atmosphere. So seeing these types of cumulus congestus clouds, you can expect that there's some type of precipitation brewing. Um, so we'll move on to the next one here. Sorry, here's another picture of cumulus congestus, my bad. Uh, so here we've got our still vertical development occurring. We typically see these in the tropics uh, where they can provide abundant precip in the tropics, but elsewhere without that constant influx of moisture, maybe not. Uh, the forms are these often puffy looking features that we see here. Uh, they can detach themselves successively from the main portions of the cloud and be carried away. Uh, and they are the result of the development of cumul cumulus mediocris or cumulus uh, humilis, sometimes the result of alto cumulus castellanus clouds or the strato cumulus castellanus clouds we talked about earlier. Uh, they can sometimes transform into cumul cumulonimbus cavus. Uh, clouds here. So we're starting to see, you can almost say calving or kind of this rapid growth occurring uh, here in that image on the bottom left. So the protuberances of its kind of upper portion as this is pushing vertically, here we can see the effects of that. Um, so these Cumulonimbus calving clouds are obviously indicative of uh, cumuliform clouds that can produce things like lightning, hail, or thunder. Uh, and this one is what gives rise to what we call cumulo, uh, just the general cumulonimbus or larger clouds. There are anvil clouds. So if this was to continue to develop vertically, you could see it kind of puffing out as it hits some type of inversion point and then this whole area you know kind of flattening out and becoming one gigantic cloud we'll talk about those here in just a second sometimes you get these pileus clouds uh that are pretty fascinating these clouds form above these large cumulus clouds that we see here so the pileus cloud is this cloud here um let me see above us. There we go. That's our pileus cloud uh, that are kind of displaced as the upward motion of that convective cloud distorts the layer of air above it. Um, pileus is basically just Latin for skull cap. So you can see here, it's starting to form there, getting compressed and developing there. The last vestiges of it here, and then that cumulonimbus cloud breaks through. So there's a phenomenon here that we call glaciation or glaciated clouds, where if you notice the wispiness in the upper portions here, notice how there's almost a distortion and a wispiness up at the top there uh, of these cumulonimbus clouds. So the transformation of cloud particles from these super cooled water drops to ice is described as having a glaciated upper portion within the cloud. No, you don't notice it here, right? Or below here, but you definitely notice it up in these ones. Notice that wispiness above this cumulonimbus cloud here. And as we alluded to, these are our cumulonimbus clouds. These are huge towering clouds with dark bases that you see here. Uh, and these 
bright white sides. So these are associated with heavy rains, thunderstorms, and hail. Frequently have this kind of anvil shape, which we see a little bit here, but primarily here. Um, so this is what we would call one version of it. This is Cumulonimbus capiatus, uh, where we see kind of this distinct wispiness at the very top. Um, these can be associated with what we would call squalls or showers or thunderstorms, uh, sometimes hail. So that is unique to the Cumulonimbus genus. Here we've got the iconic Cumulonimbus cloud or Cumulonimbus incus. Uh, incus is Latin for anvil. These are also known as anvil clouds. You notice this big shape here looks strikingly like an anvil. So you've got a vast amount of vertical development within this cloud. And what's happening here is some type of either temperature inversion or st uh, stratospheric stability where basically you it can't pierce that layer. So it's reached some form of stratospheric stability here. Uh, and it's formed this characteristic flat anvil shape. Uh, it signifies that a thunderstorm is in its mature stages, succeeding that cumulonimbus cavus stage. Uh, and they are kind of a, this cumulonimbus incus is a subform of the cumulonimbus capiatus that we just kind of talked about. Here's another uh, picture of the cumulonimbus incus clouds. Then we've got mammatus clouds. So these are smooth, rounded shapes, sometimes formed on the underside of cumulonimbus clouds. What they're resulting from is downdrafts within the clouds. So wind rushing down and downdrafts rushing down and kind of pushing that cloud out. So you can see it here. Got a really good picture of it here. Um, these are these, these mamma, you'd call mammatus, uh, appear on the underside of primarily cumulonimbus incus clouds or these anvil clouds. Um, and they can be a sign of some pretty strong downdrafts in general. So this is likely a pretty hefty storm that's rolling through if you see uh, mammatus clouds. Then we can get into some of the other cloud form, clouds and cloud forms. We've got things like Fractus clouds, also known as scud clouds. These are low detached clouds that you see through here. Uh, what these basically are, they're detached clouds caught in the outflow of a thunderstorm without downdrafting. Um, they can also see, be seen below stratus clouds, but they're not really connected to another cloud bank like you would see here. They're kind of these detached forms. Pyrocumulus clouds, these are caused by fire, volcanoes, or industry. Uh, an intense heating of moist air. They only form in calm wind situations. You get this almost like pancaking layer here of cloud formation. Uh, in this case, forming above a wildfire. Contrails, obviously this is condensed exhaust from jet aircrafts. Uh, this is important when considering the climate effects on clouds. We can talk about uh, some of the, of the effects of clouds and their uh, reflective capacity in a little bit. We talked about that in an earlier video as well uh, when we were talking about things like albedo. Cloud formations, we can have lenticular clouds that we touched on earlier, Kelvin, uh, Kelvin Helmholtz waves, cloud streets, wall clouds, or shelf clouds. These lenticular clouds, we touched on these earlier, but these are stationary lens-shaped clouds that form uh, over mountains at high altitude. They suggest that there's stable, moist air that's flowing over the mountain, creating basically a standing wave. They're not really that mobile. Uh, they're also indica indicative of a region of turbulence, some type of upward movement of air, uh, obviously being pushed up and over this mountain. Kelvin Helmholtz waves, uh, you, it's, these are a little bit more rare, uh, very short lived, but they form when two parallel layers of air are moving at different speeds. So you've got one rushing, one maybe, or you know, maybe they're going this way here. Uh, one may be moving a little bit slower. So you've got kind of this, or faster or slower. So you've got this kind of overturning here. So in this case, 
I apologize. Let me kind of erase my drawing here. Uh, in this case, you would have kind of faster air on the upstream side or on the up cloud side and maybe slower air down here. So you're getting this almost cresting, almost like a water or a wave, like a standing wave in a river. Uh, they're very short lived, um, but they're they're pretty cool to see when you do get to see them. Things like cloud streets, these form due to horizontal rolls in the atmosphere uh, and uneven surface heating. So these clouds form in updrafts in different rolls. So kind of rushing up and rushing over. You can kind of see that. Most often you see these over the ocean. So you've kind of got this, we see down in that graphic down below, uh, you've got this kind of rolling formation of clouds or of, uh, of air, pardon me, in the atmosphere, kind of leading to, at the apex of these rolls, these clouds. And then shelf and roll clouds, these are some pretty famous ones. You see these uh, with you know, major storms and especially the next one, a wall cloud. Uh, so these are low horizontal wedge-like clouds. The shelf is attached to a parent storm. The roll is removed from a parent storm. So they form due to gust fronts from the thunderstorm. So as you've got that major pulse of wind blasting through, uh, these are forming as a result of that. And then our wall clouds, these are associated with uh, incredibly severe thunderstorms, indicate areas of very strong updrafts. Um, so there's tons of air rushing up into that, you know, rising and condensing lots of moisture in that system. Uh, we also see the strongest tornadoes being formed from uh, systems with a wall cloud developed. We've got things like nacreous clouds or what we call mother of pearl clouds. These form in the stratosphere and they're best seen at the poles. Um, we don't know too much about them, unfortunately, but um, you've also got noctilucent clouds. These are sometimes seen in the mesosphere. Stars can shine through them. They're made of very tiny ice crystals. So those look like here, uh, our nacreous or mother of pearl clouds, um, these beautiful iridescent shade or colored clouds. And then our noctilucent clouds, you can see these uh, from the surface and from space. So clouds, as I mentioned in a past video, play a really important role at controlling uh, global radiation budget because they are you know, white in color, they are reflective, they, they can are very good at reflecting incoming solar radiation uh, and absorbing solar or thermal infrared or long wave radiation. And the altitude type and thickness of the cloud along with what type above and below determines whether the local net effect is to warm or cool the air surface, whether they're acting to insulate and blanket the surface or whether they allow for the escape of air uh, and that warmth and lead to cooler, uh, more rapid ranges in temperature. So things like contrails, when they're in the sky, uh, have an added effect at uh, kind of improving the reflective capacity of, uh, of the clouds. And, and we'll talk about a uh, video called Dimming the Sun, which I might have you watch in a little bit. Um, pretty fascinating example of just that. Vertical transports are their deep convective clouds that play a major role in the mixing of air parcels across the globe, um, along with moisture, aerosol particles, and gases uh, up into the free troposphere. So that vertical transport is an incredibly important aspect of our global cycles and atmospheric cycles. And from a chemistry perspective, clouds provide an environment within aqueous phase. Chemical reactions can take place within the atmosphere. Um, our aerosol particles can be substantially modified within clouds. They can be dissolved. Uh, they can bring things together. They may have chemical reactions within that because you know, you know water is a universal solvent. Uh, and then on evaporation of a droplet, a single aerosol particle is formed containing materials from everything that's contributing to it. So I know it was a bit lengthier, uh, a little bit longer than I typically like to go, but uh, a lot to talk about, a lot of different clouds. So those are our major cloud types, our major cloud heights, classifications, formations, and other information therein. So in the last one for this little group, we'll be talking about precipitation. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you're looking out at the clouds right now. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very blue sky day when I'm recording this, so I don't have any to stare at. So have a great day, and we'll see you in the next video.